posing, no, I'll agree with that. Yeah, I don't know if I'm all that provocative, but I think I'm a bit like a kipper, really. I flounder, quite gracefully, but I flounder. Mr. Ian Robbins jury relaxes at home with his fire salvage drum kit. Possessions aren't the most important part of his life, a life that's lived in any rented space available until he can find a suitable warehouse to buy. He's approaching his 37th birthday, partially crippled by polio, a singer who writes songs that are full of rhyming couplets and innuendo, like Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick, his most successful single so far. My mum said to me, write a pop thing, do a thing that'll go into the top 20 about three years, four years ago. So I said, right, oh mum, I wrote this thing called England's Glory, which was all the things that I thought were not necessarily nice, but were there about England. So it was like, um, Frankie Howard, Noel Coward and Sherlock Holmes, Frankie Vaughan, Kenneth Hall and Garden Gnomes. I can't remember all of it, but Enid Blyton. Things, all kinds of little bits and pieces. Robin Hood was in there. He's uh, returning. He's on an upper, Robin Hood. When he was seven years old, Jory contracted polio on a day out at South End Swimming Pool. As a result, he's got a withered left arm and leg, and as a child he spent years in and out of schools and special hospitals. It restricts his movement, but that's all. Although it can be a problem when he gets excited on stage. I fall over. I don't ever mean to fall over, but there are a lot of these wires about the gaff on the stage, and, and now and again one of my para boots comes in contact with one, and down I go, I tumble. I don't do it on purpose. I, I kind of, I have to go into these little dives sometimes, yeah. What, you've got to practice for? Oh, Christ, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, you, you get one eventually. I used to fall over about 15 times a day. You, obviously, uh, I mean, you are disabled. Does it's that... not obvious, is it? Well, I don't know. <coughs> uh, it... What, I mean, how does that restrict you? Um, I really, the only way it has ever restricted me was with the, the omnibus situation of it all. So, uh, missing the occasional one, which was always a good idea anyway, and request of being what they are these days. Um, and the queuing of it all. Blimey, ever queued for another six bus from the CNAs at Marble Arch, going up towards Kensal Rise? My life. I used to get on the thing and hang on to the road. When, as the bus was coming in, I'd get on the road like that and lean out and lean into them and knock them all down, or smash them all up against the... God, dear old Lord, my life. When I change my passport, I'm going to call myself a rock and roller, because I think that's really what I am. Um, I can't sing very well. I, I'm learning. I'm breathing better. I'm quite interested in actually being able to impress myself. I don't impress myself as a singer. Um, I'm not worried about it, because I'm quite a good actor, and I can get through by letting the feeling of the words that I write come out, and it's me that wrote them, so I can relate to it in that way. But. <coughs> um, I think I'll, I know quite a lot about music. I listen to a lot of music, and I've been listening to music for a long time. Jury formed a band called Kilburn and the High Roads, and for four years they played the pubs and clubs of London, places like the Hope and Anchor in Islington, that became the home of a new style of music. But in 1975, Jury disbanded the group. In 1975, when Kilburn and the High Roads... Part two. Yeah, weren't going too well, and the flat wasn't uh, too clever at the Oval. <laughs> it was always a clever flat. Um, but, um, it was 1976 when we jacked up with a second lot of Kilburns. Then I had a year and a bit off the road, or about a year and two months off the road. And uh, lots of excitement was happening. Partly, I felt, um, I wish I was there with it all, because I love it. I wish I was bouncing around, down a Roxy. Um, and partly, I felt, um, I've got to write really better things. I don't like what I'm writing now. I want to write better things. Cosmo Vinyl wasn't christened that way. He decided it would be a nice name to have for a while. He also decided to encourage Ian Jury to form another band. Since then, Cosmo has been Jury's closest advisor. And this maniac with henna on his hair comes running over the top of the seats going, hey, wait. I went, what? What's this? 
And I looked up, he's standing right on the top of the seat, whoa, Governor, whoa, and he came and sat next to me, he said, why aren't you out on the road, why aren't you gigging? I said, well, yeah, I'm writing, you know, what's the matter, leave me alone, you rat, and things. And he went, go on, get out of there again. A meeting, well, meeting him was quite good for my spirit, really, because it meant there was a bud with the and hair running about from East London saying I should be on the road. Do you know what I mean? At least that. And, uh... By 1977, Jury had produced some new songs to sing, but he needed a band to play them. <laughs> Jury met Chaz Jankel, a man who had a similar art school background, and someone who could write music that fitted Jury's unusual lyrics perfectly. The Blockheads had arrived, and an LP, New Boots and Panties, was released, which was in the album charts for 72 consecutive weeks. Um, I sort of often see music as colour. You know, um, it's actually very visual. And he's studied drama, and he does the same thing, you see? So I think, also, he feels a lot of anguish. I feel a lot of anguish. I can interpret. Um, his words musically and um, vice versa. The lyrics you write, how did they all come about? Oh, they just hang about mostly. I do little sketches, little couplets. The human leg is a source of delight, it carries your weight and governs your height, like that. And then, um, if they can be uh, kind of naturally added to, then I'll sift through them. I've got hundreds of them. There's one over there says, Christ, it's a geezer. And that's the only thing on a big bit of paper, like that. I can see a geezer sort of down the bottom there. You know. um, and then if I, if I can see there's a, enough work there to go like 10 hours on it and structure it a bit, then I would use that as a starting point as I'm looking through them. I, I really only like working in 4 4 rhythm because it's simple and it's not unnatural and it's a natural rhythm. It's just boom, it's heartbeat or whatever. And it's a dancing rhythm, and that kind of dancing is, to me, um, one of the most beautiful things in, in life. And it's one of the things that I feel really I enjoy most, and enjoy about music most. Um, and the, the sound of well, music. Well, making people dance? Not making, no, just dancing. Um, I, um, if we can make people dance, we'll be very happy. I hope we can. I hope we do. Dancing's always been... Um, if it, it's not so much the most important thing, but it's the ingredient without which. One, two, three, four. Led by Jankel, the Blockheads are recognised as being one of the best backing groups in rock music. They're all individually talented musicians and have all played successfully with other bands. As an unconventional artist, Jury has found an unconventional recording company. Hello, Tony. What am I going to see Tony about? <laughs> what do you do? Stiff Records are hidden away in a Bayswater back street, separated from their artist management offices by a vets, a poodle parlour and a pub. They're miles from Timpan Alley, the West End and the chrome and deodorant world of the multi-million pound recording giants. Jury was turned down by a lot of people, but Stiff signed him immediately they had the chance. The success that we've had lately didn't happened until it was made possible by that kind of record company existing. I really think that's true. I, I think that without them, we wouldn't have been us. We wouldn't have been able to have been us. We would have been worried all the time about great big contracts and front money and oh, all the rest of it, which I've had a little bit of before with other record companies. And all it does is scramble your eggs for you straight away. It's um, very hard to concentrate on just being a musician and writing songs and worrying about the, how you perform and things like that and rehearsing. The problem is, so at gigs, people ain't going to come with a load of loot for that. As well as being the name of his band, Blockheads is a term Dury applies to many of the people he observes. Yeah, it's like paint. They're not slinging, but it's some sort of two colour thing. Yeah. And then loads of pots of paint. Hopefully with Blockhead. Square pots of paint. And then I see Blockheads, I see a load of Blockheads outside the pub all leaving on Sunday afternoon, getting into their orange and black motor cars, like... <laughs> and driving like that, really... Mm, repressed driving. And, 
all that gear stick thing, shifting, shifting things, you know. Over the years, his act has developed into a cross between music hall, rock and roll, and pure East End. He's said to be like Charlie Chaplin and Max Wall, but he happens to sing. You say naughty things and uh, and use uh, industrial language. And industrial things. language. <laughs> <laughs> He's a rascal, isn't he? <laughs> Offenbach. Uh, well, uh, about uh, two weeks ago, I gave my mum um, a silver LP from Germany. It means quite a lot to me. It means 100,000 Germans have bought our record. If you, have to, if you have to ask what a rhythm stick is, then... Uh, it may be possible that you will never know the answer. <laughs> Jury is now famous in America, even though he said it was like Wrexham, and Germany, yeah, I mean, even though that was Romford at right angles. In May, he began a European tour. In seven weeks, the band played seven countries, and the press wanted to know all about him. English accents. It's quite difficult because you can't get across... You can't do long notes in, in German or in English. You can't go, ich liebe die... It's really strange. And in Berlin, they sing the words. How do they sing it? They, good evening, like that, but they sing them. It's really strange. I, I mean, they can't understand half of them, I'm sure. When the band arrived back in England at the end of June, they immediately started a British tour, which finally ends next week in Ilford. Uh, uh, no, that's up, upstage touch. And now off stage starts, that's it. They'll have played 69 concerts in just over three months, and for the road crew of 17 who set up the equipment, it's been a long, hard trip. They've cut out my power. I think it's too long, actually. It is the longest that I know of, of, of any major tour done throughout England and Europe. I mean, it, it amounts to 16 weeks, and that is a hell of a long tour. And the average is between four and six. So the pressures increase all on the square law as, as it goes on. How do you summon up enough energy towards these last few weeks to go through the motions? It's routine, as you say. It is just going through the motions. Absolutely. It's, uh, it has become very much routine. It's, uh, any problem is amplified about a hundred times at this stage of the tour because you are just going through it, really, sort of looking forward to the end of the tour. Each night you have to psych, it's called psyching yourself up, isn't it? That's what they do. Um, that's what we do. So I do that every night anyway. And I'm physically, I, if you do, a, I suppose it's like a game of tennis, quite a strenuous game of tennis every night. Um, if you do that every night, two hours a night, you get very healthy quite quickly. As long as you sleep and don't try and burn the candle at both ends. We steam through quite a lot. We don't, we make a lot of mistakes, but we don't mind when we make mistakes. There's no point in worrying. We don't even go, oh, look, he's dropped a stitch. Once we're out there, it doesn't really matter what happens. We're professionals in that we try as hard as we can all the time. But we're unprofessional in that we don't really give a damn if it all falls apart, quite honestly. It does fall apart quite a lot. Well, what, what's coming from there? Yeah? All right, cool. Yeah, he's ready. All right, let's have you. Okay, chaps, on we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said you'd, what would be the ideal world would be to take three months off. What would you do in the three months? I'd do nothing at all. I'd read a lot of books and probably go to the pictures a lot. And hopefully I would swim a lot. I'd do nothing until I see my kids. Um, do nothing. I wouldn't think about anything. But that position of splendid grandeur hasn't arrived yet. That, that, um, I would like to do that more than anything, really. But you must be worth a lot of money now. I'm worth exactly zilch at the moment. I owe 35,000 quid and I'm owed about 30. No, the reason that I do what I do is because I enjoy it, purely and simply. And um, I enjoy trying to make it better. And I enjoy doing it. I love it. wouldn't do it if I didn't love doing it. Um, perhaps for uh, somebody who can 
be now I'm uh, whatever secure kind of future financially probably. Um, no great weight has been lifted off my mind at all because when I was insecure, I was extremely secure. I, it's within you what you want to be, and I never envisaged and never wanted. My daddy was a chauffeur. I probably told you that before, and you do grow up not wanting to either have or be a chauffeur. If you've got a daddy who is a chauffeur, who, I don't know. Um, what did you grow up wanting to be? I wanted to be an actor when I was about 10. I think I'm doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> Ian Jury has quite a few reasons to be cheerful. He's established himself throughout Europe as one of the leading figures of rock music. Everywhere he's gone, the concerts have been sellouts. With his sing-along Essex mating songs and posturing stage presence, Ian Jury has become the first international figure to come out of the pubs like the Hope and Anchor. Reasons to be cheerful! 